will go through this year's FGDC competitions, which is a set of six competitions we ran on Kaggle for two months between March and May-ish. And uh, we're gonna hear from the organizers and uh, some of the winners are actually able to join us. Uh, we can hear some of their solutions or ideas or you know, uh, tricks on how they can, um, or tips on how they actually got the best performance on these competitions. So um, as a reminder, um, uh, we'll have another, uh, the last live session coming up this afternoon or later this evening for those of you in Asia. Uh, so please follow on our website uh, for the internal and or external um, FGBC website to see the last live session details. All right, let's get started. Um, so, oh, by the way, my name is Christine. Um, I'm from Google Research. Um, I'm part of the FGBC organization, uh, organizer team with um, Oshin, Graham, Subran, Sue, and Ryan. Um, a lot of us are here today. And uh, um, yeah, so with that, let's get started. Um, the first one, first competition uh, we're gonna cover is the Iowa Camp com competition. Sarah? Hey everyone. Um, so Christine, do you want me to share the slides or do you want to Can share my slide right now? Oh, I don't see it. Oh, maybe let me try again. I think I have stopped the screen sharing by mistake. Can you see it now? Yes, I can. Cool. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm just going to give a really brief overview of the iWildCamp competition and some of what worked and what didn't. Um, and I'm going to leave it to the individual uh, teams who are here to kind of go into detail about their methods maybe later. Um, but I just really wanted to kind of give a brief overview. Um, so go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so this year's iWildCamp competition, um, we tried to basically start tackling this concept of, of using multimodal data. So data from something like a static camera trap, which are these cameras that um, take pictures of animals out in the wild with actually satellite data that might be covering that same location. Um, and what we used as our metric was top one categorization accuracy for each of the, the species in the images. Um, and the test data was specifically from unseen camera locations. So this means camera locations that were never seen during training. And the big, cha the big challenge is trying to figure out how to generalize to these unseen camera locations in an accurate way. Next slide. Next slide, thanks. Um, so this year's data set was specifically around 280,000 camera trap images from the Wildlife Conservation Society. Um, and they were covering 552 camera locations from spread out around the globe. Um, we also provided bounding boxes from the Microsoft AI for Earth mega detector. And so basically what that's giving you is not necessarily ground truth bounding box labels, but a pretty good estimation of a weekly supervised bounding box label. And we provided all of the outputs of the mega detector, which meant that um, the competitors were able to choose their own threshold in terms of what they wanted to consider or not consider an accurate detection. And then we also provided these two types of multimodal data to try to assist with this generalization. And one of those was satellite imagery which was mostly provided by um, Eli Cole, who was one of the organizers. And the other one was data that matched our class set from iNaturalist, with the hope there of trying to help get more variability in the data of different classes to work to do a better job of categorizing them in new locations. And that data was mostly worked on by RV Gyoka, who also helped out with this competition. Um, next. So we'd love to congratulate our winning teams. Um, there was around 125 teams that, uh, that competed this year, and we were really excited to see all of the cool stuff that they came up with. Um, and I think the, all three of the top teams really like worked hard and did some really interesting stuff. So congratulations, you guys. Next slide. So what worked? Um, Generally, uh, one of the most important things, one of the things that was used by basically every com com competition team in the top 10 was context information. Um, so things like the, the ID of the location, like actually understanding that this location is separate from and distinct from other locations, the time of year or even the exact time that the image was taken. And one of the things that seemed to be the most important was sequence information. Um, and one of the largest complaints actually was that it turns out in the WCS data that we were provided, 
some of that sequence information was pretty inaccurate. And so one of the things that people did that really helped clean it up was actually redefine what a sequence was based on different thresholds of time horizons at a given camera location. Um, every team in the top 10 that we talked to used the crops from a mega detector. So it seems like actually for this generalization problem, classifying those detected crops or training a class specific detector is a much more accurate um, way to do well on new locations than trying to classify full images. And pretty much everyone started with something like trained on ImageNet or maybe trained on iNaturalist. Um, and then what didn't work on the next slide. Um, so weirdly enough, and so we have an asterisk here because what's going on is all of these things are things that were reported by some teams not to help at all and reported by maybe one team or two teams to help. And so it's kind of this like open question, like this didn't work for some people, it maybe worked for others. And so that's something that I'm really interested in digging into in the panel. Um, but most people didn't see a big boost from trying to leverage either the iNaturalist data or the satellite data, which I found really disappointing because really you would hope that we could extract some information from that that would be useful for helping generalization. Um, another thing that was interesting is that you think maybe trying to generalize these new locations, it might help to do some really aggressive data augmentation, but some teams reported that they tried some really crazy stuff and it didn't seem to help much at all. Um, and then the other thing is that all of this data has this really long tail distribution, but when teams tried some of these traditional class balancing techniques in their best models, they didn't actually find, find that that helped much either. Um, so I think all of this is really interesting and I'm really excited to kind of continue that discussion later. Thanks guys. Great, Hi. thank you, Sarah. Uh, sorry, someone uh, asking. No, no, it's me. Hi everyone, um, I'm Zhong Chi from UMass Amherst and I'm presenting the semi-supervised um, iNaturalist average challenge for this year. And uh, next slide. So the motivation of making this challenge is that we have a lot of unlabeled data, uh, current semi-supervised benchmarks such as MNIST or CBAR are too simplistic. So we want to propose a new data set that First, we um, use fine-grained classification. And second, we have class imbalance, such, the, such as like the unlabeled and unlabeled data, we have a long tail distribution. And note that uh, the test and validation data, we have a uniform distribution. So we focus on the per class accuracy. And third, we have a additional out of class unlabeled data, which are also in the birds, species but are from different categories. So we have a little bit domain mismatch here. And this is a more realistic case because in general we can have a lot of um, birds images that we found online but we don't have uh, very detailed class labels like very um, detailed species names. Uh, next slide. And this year, uh, there are a lot, a lot of teams. We have almost 30 teams. And uh, I'm very surprised that the winners can have almost 90% accuracy, which is very good. And uh, especially the first and second place, they have almost the same accuracy. And actually, one is better in the public and one is better in the private uh, leaderboard. So they are almost the same to me. And the third place also just put the, their solution on the archive today. Next slide. So I want to have a little bit summary of the method that people use. So first, how do we use in-class unlabeled data? I found that um, everyone used the pseudo-label method, which is the simple, the most, the most simple one, but it also gives the uh, best performance. Other state-of-the-art methods, such as mean teacher or mixed match, which performs the best on previous benchmarks like MNIST, does not give improvement here. So this is kind of surprising. Uh, next slide. And in addition to that, we also have uh, out-of-class unlabeled data. People have tried to use self-supervised learning methods 
on, um, for example, you can pre-train on those out-of-class unlabeled data with um, contrastive learning methods. Um, people have reported that um, training that gives little or no benefit, but one team used uh, cluster labels and pre-trained those pre -trained on those images and found it's better than the ImageNet pre-trained model. So I would like to hear more about this in the discussion later. Uh, next slide. So in conclusion, um, in this challenge, we found that the general tricks that works for fine-grained classification are still the dominant one. For example, pe all people use um, ensemble methods, test time augmentation, data augmentation, and attention maps, and so on. For the in-class unlabeled images, using the semi-supervised learning methods helps, but just the pseudo-label is good enough. Other fencing methods maybe does not work here. This also echoes our motivation that the current benchmarks are not very realistic. And third, um, using supervised learning on those out-of-class unlabeled images gives little or no benefit. Thank you. Thank you, Junchi. So next up, we'll have the plant pathology challenge. Uh, and for the speakers that are coming up, can you actually maybe just briefly introduce yourself to everyone here? We'll have a big uh, we'll have a big room right now. Oh. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. I'm Ranjita Thapa. I am a postdoctoral research associate at Cornell University in the Department of Plant Pathology. Uh, I'll be talking about the FCVC Plant Pathology 2020 Challenge dataset that we ran a competition in Kaggle to see if uh, we could find some efficient machine learning algorithm that could be used for foliar disease classification in apples. Uh, first, I would like to give a short overview of apple and uh, the problems uh, associated with apple production. Apple is one of the most important uh, fruit crop that is grown in temperate region of uh, various parts of the world. And also in the US, it is considered as one of the very high value fruit crop. But uh, there are many problems associated with apple production. Uh, the major problems are from insects and diseases. Mm. Uh, there are uh, many pathogens like virus, uh, bacteria, uh, fungi that can cause uh, severe damage in crop uh, and, uh, uh, and oftentimes causes uh, uh, more than a million of losses. So, so far in apple production, uh, the most common way of disease detection is uh, uh, human scouting where uh, crop consultants uh, goes around the orchard and try to see if there is any disease infection or not. And if there is any disease infection, they try to identify what kind of disease are there. But this method is very time consuming and also very expensive. And also most of the time, it's not very possible to go and see each and every tree to see if there is infection or not. So as a biologist, we try to see if machine learning algorithm could help us. So the main objective of this competition was to identify some potential machine learning model that could be used to classify uh, disease symptoms uh, into different disease categories. Uh, and also we wanted to distinguish uh, between uh, many disease symptoms that can appear on the same leaf. Next slide. So for this competition, we had a total data set of 3,651 RGB images. These images were captured using a Canon Revol T5i DSLR camera and smartphones under various conditions. And we basically had three different disease categories. Here in the pictures, you can see the first row is uh, the apple scab disease. And the second row here, you can see the cedar apple rust. And along with that, we also had uh, uh, disease images where we had multiple disease symptoms on the same lips. Because in natural situation, we can't, like, it's hard to expect only one disease symptoms on single leaf and uh, Usually there will be more than one disease symptoms or insect damage on the same leaf. Uh, in total, we had uh, 
1200 uh, apple scab images, uh, 1399 cedar apple rust images, and only 187 complex disease uh, images. And along with that, we also had around 865 healthy leaves. And also too, we also wanted to reflect the natural situation as much as we could. So we collected the images over a period of time and under different conditions. Like in the last row, you can see that we collected several pictures under direct sunlight and some pictures um, in indirect sunlight. So we could reflect the real situation of the field. And finally, the data set was split into 80% and 20% of training data set and test data set. Next slide. Yeah, now, the competition was launched at Kaggle on March 9, 2020, and it was open until May 26, 2020. And we were very excited to see a large, um, like many participation in this uh, project, because this is the first time we launched the competition and there were all like, uh, 1,317 teams participated. And based on the uh, public uh, leaderboard, we saw that more than 20 teams reported an AUC value of greater than 0 0.985. And also there were almost 31% uh, of the teams who had top entries above 0 0.97 AUC. And uh, finally, we decided top three winners based on uh, private leaderboard. And the first team um, had a, an AUC score of 0 0.98445. For five. It's the, it was very similar score. Like the second team had a 0 0.98182 AUC score. And third team had a 0 0.98089 AUC score. And uh, the, uh, based on the model, first team had used Ceres Next Net 50 model. And the second winner had used PNS Net 5 large model. And the third team had used efficient net B7 model. Uh, next slide. So actually, since this is the first time we launched the competition, we didn't know much about uh, the data set, what kind of data set we could use and how big the data set would be better. So uh, we are very excited from this result and we are looking forward to launch the competition next year. And for the competitors, we have few questions so that we could improve for next time. The first question is about imbalanced data set. Now, because uh, you know, this data set does not have equal number of uh, images in each disease categories. And I, we wonder like if that could cause any problem on developing efficient machine learning algorithm. And the second question is about multiple disease category because in the multiple disease category, we had uh, uh, several images, like uh, since uh, one leaf can have multiple disease symptoms, uh, it is most uh, probable that uh, the other leaf in the same disease category may not have the same kind of symptoms and same number of symptoms. So we also wonder if that would be a difficult situation to classify them into separate disease categories. And uh, the other question is about the data set, like uh, how much, uh, how big the data set uh, is recommended for developing more accurate and robust machine learning model. And the last fi final question is about the overfitting of the model. Uh, we want to know that uh, how the overfitting of the model was looked and how they deal with the condition. Yeah, next slide. Uh, finally, I would like to acknowledge all the uh, all the uh, people who actively participated and uh, you know, worked for making the pro competition very successful. First, I would like to thank Dr. Avis Khan from the Plant Pathology Department of Cornell Agritech and Jack Bullion who helped on taking all the images. And I would also like to thank Dr. Serge and Dr. Noha from Cornell Agritech. And uh, I want to remember uh, Cornell Initiative for Digital Agriculture for funding for this project. And at last, I want to thank all the FCVC member and organizer for making this competition so successful and organizing this competition. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ranjita. Uh, I saw that you have posted a few questions for the competition winners. Uh, let's maybe hear the other competitions first because some of the questions you post are probably shared across different um, competitions and we'll do, do, do the discussion. 
after the other competition uh, organizers announce their winners. So next up, uh, we'll have the Herbarian Challenge. Uh, hi, my name is Kiet. I'm uh, from Google Research, uh, and I'm very, uh, I want, first I want to acknowledge the, uh, this challenge would not have been possible without the support of Barbara and Melissa from the New York Botanical Garden, uh, who were partnered with us and kindly provided us with this data set for this challenge. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is the second year we're running this challenge. Uh, similar to the last year, we're doing species classification for digitally imaged herbarium sheets. The main difference is that this year we greatly scaled up the challenge. Uh, we went from about 50,000 examples last year to 1.1 million examples. Um, and the distribution is a lot more long tail. Uh, as you can see, we have a minimum of three examples to a maximum of 700 plus examples per species. Uh, as with last year, we also blurred the labels and barcodes. Uh, so that the models would not use those to distinguish the, the species. Uh, in addition to the, the species labels, uh, we also provided super category labels such as the family and genus of the species, as well as the region information as to broadly where the species could be found. Uh, because this distribution is so long tilt, the metric we chose this time uh, was macro average F1 score, which is basically calculating the F1 score per class and then taking an average across all of them. Uh, this, the aim is to help deal with the imbalance in uh, class distribution. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, here are just some examples of the uh, herbarium sheets that they would be classifying. Uh, in these examples, the, the labels have not been blurred though. Uh, next slide. Um, so there were about 150 something teams who participated in the challenge. Uh, we would like to contribute all these three teams uh, the top three teams uh, from uh, VIN uh, Big Data Institute uh, based in Vietnam, uh, the Alibaba Sessa Mine team, uh, as well as uh, Ian from the Nanjing University of Science and Technology. Uh, one thing I do want to note is that the first and second place team, there was actually, the difference was literally 0.1%. So I think you just need to pick a slightly better random seed and uh, you may have, who knows, you may have one. Um, but yeah, but, but honestly, the, I think the, all of the top teams, the F1 score was uh, on around 0 0.884, I believe, which is really, really high and much higher than uh, I thought would be possible for this challenge. Uh, I'll, I'll go through a uh, next slide, please. I'll go through a rough uh, summary of the approaches here. Um, so please feel free to contact uh, the authors or, or me later if you want more details. Uh, very broadly, uh, for the first team's approach, they use efficient net. Uh, they did. Uh, two two stage training, uh, where, sorry, next slide, please. Right. Uh, so in the first stage, they actually sampled. Uh, they only use the top one thousand most frequent, uh, uh, classes first into to in order to do the training, and then, uh, after they had done that, they, they put all the rest of the classes back in, uh, to, to to fine tune the, the model. Um, they also had an ensemble. Uh, where they had a simple two-layer stacking network to combine the, uh, the predictions from the different models. Uh, and they, there was some post-processing that they did that I'll, I'll talk about it after I've gone through all three approaches. Uh, next slide. So the Alibaba group uh, used uh, one of a, a novel architecture that they, they had called TUSNet, which is a modifi modification uh, of ResNet, uh, I encourage you to go to search it on archive because uh, I think it was published, uh, it was uploaded archive maybe about two weeks, one or two weeks ago. Uh, again, they also did two stage training um, uh, where they had basically had two different uh, image resolutions when they're doing the training. Uh, next slide. Um, sorry, next, next slide again. Um, okay, so one thing that they right they, they mentioned this more in the in the discussion post on Kaggle, but they actually uh, instead of using um, all of the classification uh, uh, like a full, the full dimension of classification labels, they actually had a bottleneck uh, layer to help uh, them train more efficiently and uh, be able to have more more effects for the training. That also allowed them to use the soft triple triplet loss um, in in the training. Uh, next slide. Um, so for the third team, they used the SC ResNet and the LIP ResNet uh, architectures. 
uh, similar to the previous two teams, they also did uh, two straight stage, stage training. And just, just as this was the second team, they did the, the training with different image resolutions at each stage, uh, along with a few uh, what we call standard tricks for, uh, for uh, fine grain recognition. Um, and they also did ensembling, just as the first top two teams as well. Uh, next slide. Yep. Okay. So I also wanted to kind of give a like an overall s summary of uh, what kind of worked well and didn't work well for uh, for the teams across. So we noticed that all of the top three teams use multiple stage training. They use cross and entropy loss and ensembling of models. Uh, and they also did this trick where uh, in the competition we actually limited the number of examples in a test set to be between one to ten. Uh, and they actually leveraged that and so if they if their model predicted more than 10 they would actually flip those labels to the next highest one which gave them like a one percent uh, increase which i thought was very interesting and it's something that we may try to want to avoid next time in future competitions um yeah that's that's all for her program great thank you so much kia so uh coming next up is the i materialist fashion challenge from this year Hi, I am Meng Ling, and I'm a graduate stu student from Cornell University. And if you go to next slide, this year's, for this year, I Materialist Fashion Challenge, we present a data set with a new standardized fashion ontology, which is informed by the product description from the web and built by fashion experts. It contains 46 apparel categories, including 27 main apparel items and 19 apparel parts and 294 fine grain apparel attributes. So on average, each image was annotated with 7.3 instances, 5.4 categories and 16.7 attributes. And if you, if you see the next slides, this year, um, for the task, additional to produce the mask for the apparel categories, our participants also need to predict the, the associate attributes for each mask in each image. And this year, we have 56 teams participated and received a total of 684 submissions. And I also, I list our top three winning teams um, on next slides. So congratulations to our top three winning teams. And I'm, oh, I'm also really excited that our first place winner, Oleg, is here for our panel discussion later. So now I'll briefly talk about his solution first. So for his solution, um, a single mask RCN model with, relative, uh, with new, newly proposed a spine, SpineNet 153 with FPM backbone uh, is used, and, and, and the extra head is also added to classify the attributes. The attributes head was trained with the focal loss, and for the training, the model is pre-trained on COCO datasets. And for the, the data augmentations, additional to the common strategies which is used in detections, um, he also used one of the auto-augment policies and there's no test time augmentation during the inference. And next slide, please. So unfortunately, our second and third place winners cannot join us today due to the time differences. Here, I include a brief summary of the, uh, their solutions. And there are also links to a more detailed write-up and explanations uh, if you guys want to see more. So we will revisit the solution during the discussion session. Thanks. Great, thank you, Molly. And uh, last up is the IMET collection challenge from this year. Hi, uh, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to FGVC. Uh, I'll cover the IMET collection in FGVC 7, which is next time uh, we collaborate the mesh on the museum art. Uh, next. Uh, so a little bit about the uh, the program behind this challenge. Uh, so the MAP Open Access Program is an effort initiated by MAP, which established in 2017. 
And uh, in this effort, they display uh, capture all the high quality images of uh, like 400K of them uh, and among the 1.5 million artwork objects uh, owned by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And there are a lot of fun activities supported by this program. For example, Animal Crossing, and in Animal Crossing, you can scan the QR code to get your artwork and whatnot. If you don't know what is Animal Crossing, it's just a game, training game like cookies or thing. Uh, next. Okay, so this is a, a second time uh, we do this. Uh, and last year we, uh, we launched a, a competition focused on free tech attributes and uh, culture attributes. So we had uh, one, about like 1,000 attribute tags and 155K images. And this year we include three other uh, verticals of attributes, medium, dimension, and the country. And we also increase size of uh, attribute uh, set and also the number of images. So this is basically uh, the similar artwork uh, attribute recognition task, but bigger. Yeah. Next. Uh, yeah, con congratulations to our winners. Uh, the first one is uh, from company uh, DNA. Uh, I, I, I would like to mention that this uh, so the, this team is also a gold medal winner from last year. Uh, and we are very happy to see them, see them again here uh, for I mean, first place. Uh, and the second uh, team, second place team is from a Deep Blue uh, AI. They are from Shanghai. And uh, the third team, uh, actually, I don't know where they're from, but yeah, they are here uh, today. So maybe you can ask them. And so, uh, next. So I'll briefly go through the uh, solution for the, for the three teams. Uh, so the first team. Uh, so they use a ensemble uh, with uh, with manual select weights, and uh, each of the three branches are are shown here. The first one is uh, a combination of three backbone models and using late fusion. One interesting thing the technique is used is uh, decaying and voting uh, before the final ensemble. And uh, the I think the the second branch used a cosmic cosmic loss. And the third branch use the attention branch network. Uh, and uh, for, I mean, which one, which one contributes uh, most? Actually, I'm not sure, but uh, they are here. So they, I think they will be happy to answer the question in the panel discussion. Uh, next. Yeah, so here is their summary. Uh, so basically they, they use uh, different backbones and using KNN and uh, apply, employ attention branch networks. Uh, yeah, uh, next. So the, the, this is a solution for the Deep Blue AI's uh, work. And uh, they, they use the ResNet, I mean, they use a similar backbone model and uh, they use BCE loss as their loss function. And uh, they apply like, I think the, the standard augmentation and uh, the consign annealing LR for the uh, learning rate, uh, learning rate optimization. Uh, and uh, the final, the, the best performance is also obtained by ensemble. Uh, next. So is this, a third, uh, this is our third place solution. They are also here today. Uh, so yeah, they use a similar set of backbone models and uh, the final best result is actually uh, a combination of three of them instead of four. Uh, next, I think that's it. Thank you. Great, thank you, Chen Yang. And uh, this is um, all the six competitions we ran this year. Again, we were super excited to see a record-breaking number of teams participating. And uh, we're very happy that uh, there are quite a few top 30 teams from these six competitions who are with us today. Um, uh, and as uh, we've heard that uh, um, some of us have questions for the winning teams and we hope to get, you know, some more details and tips from them. Uh, so we're going to do um, a QA and a and basically panel discussion. Um, I believe some competition, owner, uh, competition organizers have questions already. And for the audience, if you have quite questions uh, for the winners, um, you can type in the chat window in this Zoom session and we'll just go through them as they come up. I'll stop presenting.
Um, so do you want to go through like the competitions in terms of like the specific questions or do you do it? Should we just sort of just generally go from the chat? Um, I think if you have questions for the winners who are here, let's go through them. And otherwise, um, I'll be monitoring the chat for just general audience questions for the winners as well. Awesome. Um, so one thing I wanted to ask um, the people who are here from the iWildCam competition. Um, so one thing that um, came up was that some of the data that's provided by these like expert biologists can actually be quite noisy. Um, and so I wanted to ask the, com the, com the competition winners, you know, how did you address that label noise? Um, did you have any specific tactics to try to handle it? Um, because I actually think it's quite a realistic scenario in, in the space. And so I think it's important that models are able to handle that noise of data. So I was curious if you guys um, did anything in particular to try to either clean it up um, offline or just handle it in some way. Either one of the teams want to speak up? I think we should have um, maybe, um, is someone from our first place team here? Hi, uh, I'm Bing Chen. I'm, I'm from Macquarie Research and Engine. I'm, cool. I'm actually first place, uh, first place at this Avacam competition. Awesome. Uh, the, the noise, the label noise we encounter in the competition uh, are many, many from the sequence, sequence, uh, sequence information, uh, similar to the second place uh, uh, winner. Uh, the sequence data uh, is actually one sequence that contains thousands of images and they are unrelated. Uh, our fix is to uh, use the date time information and the location information to regroup this those images into uh, new sequences. And for those recruit sequences, we refine our predictions. And we get better score uh, using this technique, like 10% uh, 10 10 accuracy. Uh, wow, that's really big. Um, so that kind of ties into my second question, and maybe um, you and then also the second place um, team could speak up to this one. Um, or I guess the third place team is here. What did you find was the most important thing you did? Like what of all of the different things, like maybe sequences or you know, data augmentation or using like the location IDs, like what made the biggest difference? What was, or using detection labels possibly? Uh, the, the, big, uh, the biggest difference uh, we observe is the sequence, sequence information. Uh, as mentioned, uh, another important uh, information is the bunny box. Um, we found that using Mac detector V4 can uh, obtain a better bunny box than object Mac detector V3, and that gave us a one or two accuracy jump in the leaderboard. Um, and another another information we use is the uh, camera location location ID, uh, because the test set has different location than the training set, and we need to generalize across locations. So we add, a, add an extra uh, fully connected layer uh, to the classification network, and and using a gradient reversal layer to force the network to learn a Location invariant, uh, location invariant uh, 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 feature uh, across locations. So that 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 gave us like uh, zero point five or to one point five jump in accuracy. Uh, awesome. That's, that's, mm. that's our our solution. That's fantastic. Yeah, no, I, I think it's really cool. Like um, just seeing sort of how the different parts um, play a role. Uh, so Stephen, what did you find was the most important? Thing that you did in terms of boosting the I think I have two answers. So the first one is like uh, Joe just mentioned is the sequence uh, sequence tricks. Well, the other thing is like more powerful model because it's a fine uh, fine grained data set anyway. So a lot of, for example, we have uh, a lot of images such as labeled as different kinds of birds, but 
visually speaking, is all the same for me. At least for me, maybe I wear glasses, so I can't distinguish all the all the birds from each other very clearly. So uh, we find out uh, of uh, models specifically for fine grained features will be much beneficial. So uh, in our solution, we use the a network called NTS, uh, which is developed in last year in uh, IEV paper. So that model is pretty inspiring because uh, he not only used the routine like ResNet to do the classification, classification job, but uh, also uh, he introduced a lot of features from the image, uh, which can add more information for the local regions of the image. For example, for a bird image, it can focus or you know, uh, provide information from the, the feet of the birds, from the feather and from the head. So we can get it, all the features together and to predict uh, a better score. So I think the, uh, a model specifically for the, this specific type of uh, mission is more important than the prediction by sequence. Although, the, although that trick is actually, uh, from my experience, maybe it's not 10% boosting, but at least 8% or 5% improvement on the leaderboard. Awesome, that's super cool. All right, thanks guys. So I think maybe when we go back to the general discussion, we might all be able to go in again, but I'd be really interested to, um, I guess now go to the next competition and see if there's any specific questions. Great. Uh, John Chi, I think some of the winners from your competition is here too, right? Yeah. So for the semi-supervised challenge, um, the all three top three winners are here, I think, um, Jake and Xiaopeng and uh, Chui Chen. And I'd like to ask all of you that, um, how would you use the out of domain unlabeled data? I think some of them, some of you report not useful, some got slight improvement. Maybe you can um, discuss about this. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's so true. <laughs> but our, uh, so, so we are the top one team. But uh, for us, we found that the out of distribution um, data are not very useful as they only get like 0 0.1 improvement. So we found that didn't use them at all. And we, yes. <laughs> and uh, we, have, we have tried several, like three strategies to solve this, to, to, to uh, tackle this out of distribution data. One is to use the unsupervised learning uh, technique to get the feature and uh, and 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 get the feature and the cluster the class cluster them to like to fine tune our model again with the cluster cluster enable like to fine tune again to improve our base uh back home this is one solution and it did not did not improve much and the second solution is to um to entirely uh consider it as the uh, how do you say the the background class background uh, yeah background category, and it doesn't work either. And also we we again use it like the out of distribution like the as the as as the in the distribution on label data, and uh, to like to pseudo label them, and to get to the label and it didn't. Get improved. So I'm I'm all I also very curious about like how other team, you know, implement this data. So I'm curious about. It. I remember one of the teams used the cluster label to pre-train. I forget which one now. Uh, is it Rao, Yongming or Chui Chen? Do you want to speak up? I think uh, you're muted, so we can't hear you. Sorry, sorry. No worries. Me? Okay, sorry for that. I'm Ye Zhi from Baidu. Uh, uh, on behalf of Tracer to attend this workshop, uh, actually we are not directly using the out of data, out of label, out of class data, but uh, we using the uh, unsupervised clustering uh, from the out of class data to uh, cluster 
about into 10,000 uh, classes and use them to train a classification model. And we found this is very, uh, very good for pre-training start and using this pre-training model to fine tune with the label data. And then with this data, with this model to do the pseudo labeling in the uh, in-class unlabeled data. Yeah, so we got uh, one set of the uh, pseudo labeling data set. And on the other hand, we also do some uh, supervised modeling with the label data and mining, uh, mining with the uh, in-class unlabeled data. And then we got another pseudo label pseudo labeling data set. Uh, so uh, finally, we fuse two data set, one from the uh, Mm, one from the model from uh, uh, out of class data and one from the uh, in class uh, supervised uh, method. We, we fuse two data set to get our final training data set. Yeah, that is how we using the out of class data. We not directly use them, but use them to uh, for training our pre model. Thank you. I think someone asked um, modern techniques like MoCo, SSL, and UDA outperform simple pseudo labeling. Uh, I remember that all of the teams report um, pseudo label is the best. Um, any of you want to comment on this? Mm, yeah, I, I agree. I, I agree with you. Um, we, we try MoCo. Yeah, we we only try MoCo, but this is the most like well, one of the most typical unsupervised learning methods, and um, we found that the MoCo the feature uh we we also visualize the feature space of different uh, uh oh, okay uh, we we visualize the feature space of the unsupervised learning and uh, the supervised learning, and we found that the unsupervised learning cannot uh, have a very clear classify. And their class, and they, they do have cluster, but their cluster mm, does not have very clear semantic information. They, they, so I would say that the cluster is based on the pretext, uh, the like the, the the like the texture information or other. You know, it's not, not uh, anyway. It's not semantic information. It's not like the. Like they, 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 they always to cluster like the the big sky, uh, the clear sky, like this, this this very high level information to one cluster, while they, 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 they do not like tar target on the bird information, which we we are really interested in. So we, we think that the super like the semantic data is the key factor to like to get a better feature, so the unsupervised cannot do that. Okay, to uh, conclude, I guess you're saying that uh, those um, uh, unsupervised methods is hard to distinguish the fine-grained details. Yeah, 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 that's true. Cool, uh, thank you, Jake and G for joining us. Uh, we'll have some time after this for, for more general discussion as well. Um, now I want to move on to uh, probably the winner teams from the plant pathology competition. Um, this is the most com most popular competitions this year. There were a lot of um, competitors, so uh, congratulations on coming out as a top three. Um, Ranjita, I remember you already had a few questions you had in mind, which you wanted to ask. The yeah, winner. yeah, yeah. I had I have a few questions, and I had already emailed these questions to all winners so they could prepare the answers. Uh, I can see Clay here. And I believe there should be one more team too. Yeah. Maybe Clay, you can go ahead and answer the questions. Ranjita, can you repeat the question again to the audience? Oh, yeah, sure. So actually, we didn't have very balanced kind of data set. Our data set was pretty imbalanced. And in each disease categories, we didn't have equal number of images. So I was wondering like, if such kind of Im imbalanced data set or 
Yeah, I think the uh, balanced data set. Yeah, I think the imbalanced data definitely caused some problems. Um, I think as you showed earlier, there was not many of the multi uh, disease um, leaves. And so I think that was a difficulty where basically what I ended up doing was a lot of data augmentation and upsampling um, the multi disease leaves. Uh, but I think it would be helpful, yeah, to have a little bit more of that because I think it was probably the hardest uh, leaf to classify and it was also the uh, <laughs> the one with the least amount of data. Uh, so that was definitely difficult. Um, uh, but yeah, what I ended up doing is really just upsampling it and doing like different data augmentation to everything. And that seemed to to work okay, but it was still... Uh, fairly difficult to classify that in particular. Uh, my model actually ended up um, classifying the, the other uh, categories pretty well, but yeah, I'd say for the, the multi-disease was, was definitely tricky. Uh, okay, yes, thank you. Yeah, the other question is about uh, the data set. How big data set do you think uh, would be better to have more robust model? because we are looking forward to launch the competition again next year. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't have an exact number for that. I think, you know, more data always helps. Um, and again, especially with the multi uh, disease leaves also, I don't know if the other competitors came into this too, but also the, the scab um, seemed a little more difficult. I think there was also less, uh, images on that. So I think maybe just having sort of an even number for all the categories, um, especially something like the multi-disease where it was a tricky one and there was only, I think, you know, less than 200 images on that. Uh, I'd say if you could have, you know, a few, like over several times more than that, um, that would probably be helpful. Okay, a final question is about the overfitting of the model. So how did you deal with overfitting of the model? So, I actually just used, um, yeah, the efficient at V7 implementation. So I, I did some of my own models before. It was my first competition, so I was just sort of playing around with it. But I ended up using, you know, one of the state-of-the-art uh, models. Um, and so for me, data augmentation definitely helped with um, uh, overfitting and I think efficient that honestly handles a lot of that itself inherently so um, yeah yeah thank you thank you so much yeah it's very impressive that's your first competition and then you're coming out as one of the top three for such a popular one <laughs> is there another uh, top three winner for the plant pathology uh, competition that's uh, with us right now Yes, I'm. I, I mean, it's a, a kind of an Alibaba group, and we are the first to train there. Yeah. So, do you have uh, comments that you can share with the audience here on Ranjita's questions before? Uh, you know, with uh, balanced data sets and with um, yeah. Uh yeah, we we do have some something special. Uh, we we train the model with five board course recommendation, and we do self distill, uh, which is we train five five board model and create uh, a soft label, and we uh, assemble the soft label and hard label, and then we train the, uh, our final model, and use this method our score uh, in the public board and the private board are uh, is quite similar and we, we don't have much uh, or fit. yeah. And that's all. Great, thanks for sharing some of your perspective. Um, before we move on to the Herbarium Challenge, I just want to make a quick note on time. So we're, um, off like the official time for finishing this session is actually in four minutes, but uh, um, we're going to be here, and if you, um, either audience or competition winners, if you can stay with us, uh, we'd definitely love to continue the conversation. 
um, I think we still have three competitions uh, where the winners are about to talk about their special sauces. So, so yeah, so feel free to, to stick around. We'll continue this uh, conversation even though the official time is about, to, is about to come to an end. So for the Hebridean competition, well, actually personally, it's one of the ones I'm most surprised about because I, thought, I personally thought that was a very difficult task. But seeing the top performances um, were just very impressive. Um, yeah. So two of the two of the Hyperion teams, uh, the number one team and the number two team are here. And I guess in the interest of time, maybe what I would like to ask them to share is sort of what they felt like was the most critical technique they used to, to help them achieve this result. Um, and especially for me personally, I'm kind of interested in like how they dealt with the long tiltness um, of the data set. So maybe you can start with um, that, I think. Hello, my name is Dat, and uh, I'm from WinBDI IT. And um, I think the most, uh, uh, for us, there are two important components. Uh, the first one is that we find that the, the data set is very long tail, so there are, lots, there are many class that have a lot of uh, instance. So, so from when I uh, inspect the model, I see that uh, for the class that have many instance, the probability for their class is very high. So we uh, find something to uh, minimize that. And uh, we come up with the, something that called a uh, mass entropy loss. The idea is that uh, they, uh, they have to uh, not, not help the model not to confident in uh, any class by uh, maximum the entropy or uh, the information for each class. I, I find that it very helpful. Um, it's boost our performance by around 1%. And another component is uh, about modeling printing. It helps us, I, I mean, uh, the two state training. Yeah, uh, two state training. Uh, because some some class is very, have very little instance. So we want the model to learn from uh, the high shot class first so or they can learn the herbarium features and then transfer them to the low sort class. I, I think that the two components have boost our performance. So that's for me. Cool. Thanks very much. That um I, I, I put a link in the chat to one of the techniques that he was talking about. I'll also paste in the link for the the Imprinted waste data as well. Uh, maybe uh, Husam and Tal, I think if you are here, maybe you can talk a little bit of like what you thought was the most critical techniques that you used. Yeah, so uh, my name is Husam. Uh, we're from Alibaba Group. Uh, so about the, the herbarium challenge, uh, one of the most critical is, uh, is the handling the long tail and the class imbalance. Uh, where uh, we used uh, our uh, backbone to resonate uh, with uh, a large batch size uh, alongside with uh, soft triplet loss and uh, in order to learn uh, better features. Uh, and then at, towards the end of the training, uh, after the model had learned a, a very good representations, uh, of uh, of the features, we applied uh, a simple uh, a class imbalancing uh, loss, uh, just mul multiplying by the inverse uh, frequency of the class, and, uh, um, and it, uh, this handling of the class imbalance was really uh, boosted the accuracy, uh, uh, both in the public and uh, a private leaderboard. Yeah. Cool. Thanks so much. Um, I've linked some of the, the, the paper that uh, I think I believe you also shared on Kaggle uh, with the rest of the participants. Uh, congrats again to to both uh, Dat Husam and Tal. Um, I think you did uh, like I, like Christine said. I also was very skeptical that we will get such good results, but I was very pleasantly surprised. So thank you, and congrats.
Uh, yeah, also as a plug for uh, the Hebrean challenge, actually uh, he has a collaborator from the New York Botanical Garden, uh, Barbara, will join us um, in uh, one and a half hours for the last live session of the GBC7. So if you're interested to hear more about challenges in Hebrean sheep recognition for botanical science, uh, please join us at that time. Um, coming up is I Materialist Challenge. Uh, I think I already saw a couple of winners in this chat, in this uh, group. Yes, so I have a question for Oleg, who is our first place winner. So he, your solution use, so for uh, inf inference time, your solution use different thresholds for each attributes of each category, which I found this choice very interesting because it shows the multitask nature of our data set and our task, which is detection and um, classification, a power category classification and attributes classification. So um, I wanna ask why do you choose this approach or how do you find these thresholds? Or did you try any other alternatives? Um, I mean, uh, uh, another possible alter alternative is just to use threshold per attribute so and just basically just find the best threshold across all the predictions across all the categories uh, but uh, i think uh, and it's like gave me slightly better results if you actually choosing thresholds uh, per category per attribute so intuitively i think it's because uh, different categories actually have Mm, a little bit different uh, sizes so boundary boxes, let's say, and different aspect ratios of those boundary boxes on the image. So basically, uh, when it comes uh, into uh, pulling layers for regions of interest, so when we get in these feature maps for regions of interest, it's actually kind of affects the feature maps. So I believe that uh, it actually gives predictions of different confidences and it makes sense to uh, do different optimization for the threshold for different categories. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I didn't try, uh, didn't, I tried just uh, uh, getting thresholds for the attributes in general, but again, it's worked slightly, slightly worse. Uh, and uh, yeah, you asked me if, uh, yeah, try something else. Uh, uh, I think um, another thing I didn't have time, but probably would try is to use graph nature of the labels. So basically, if uh, you have your predictions for the jacket, for example, for the attributes, so it's uh, very likely that uh, the sleeves will have exactly the same attributes. <laughs> so, and uh, probably we could uh, use exactly this uh, graph properties of those labels to somehow uh, increase performance of the attributes, I think. So in sum, um, you're, you want to explore the relationships between among attributes and categories? Uh, yeah, so I think I want to explore relationships between different uh, categories because, for example, sleeve it will be a different category and jackets will be another, but they actually uh, belongs to each other. <laughs> so, but in the, in the day to day, it's actually different annotations. Uh, yeah, so. oh, I, I also want to mention that um, I had a quick chat with our second place uh, winner mm -hmm. earlier this discussion. Um, he also mentioned that he want to try this graph approach for different categories and uh, masks and attributes. So I think that would be a really good follow-up work to do. So yeah, by probably. the way, congratulations and thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and uh, actually related to what we're talking about, the last competition I met is also attribute classification uh, challenge. Um, I think some of the winners are here, especially DNA who have won twice in a row. So. Yeah, uh, I have a question for uh, Masaki. Uh, so, so which which technique you apply do you think is uh, mostly useful? I have, I see you answered uh, the key is the most useful one. Can you elaborate more, or any of your teammates 
could answer that. Thanks. Uh, hello. Oh, uh, uh, should hey Yoko, can you answer it? Yeah, I can hear you. Sorry, uh, actually, I couldn't catch your words. Uh, at the end of your questions, uh, you asked about uh, KNN or... Yes, or I mean, which one is most useful? And uh, it, I mean, if it is a KNN, can you expl uh, explain a little bit more and why it, why it is useful? What's your observation and whatnot? Uh, yeah, uh, that's uh, the reason why I, why I use KNN is uh, to capture uh, co-occurrence. Uh, as Masaki written here, and in in other competitions in like uh, fine grained image retrieval or something like that, uh, Canon tends to perform very very well. So uh, I choose Canon for uh, in this competition. Cool. Uh, I I also see you post uh, in the group that uh, something about the customized uh, loss. Uh, can you explain a little bit more about that? Uh, you mean custom loss is uh, focal robust, robust loss, or the loss I did in chat? Which one? Uh, the last, yeah, the last you written in the in the chat in, in the group. Like uh, yeah. You mentioned it, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, I found that I found out that uh, in some samples uh, levels are missing, so uh, we wanted to uh, suppress the effect of these and uh, these rubber noises. And the uh, metrics of the uh, IMED competition penalizes uh, false, false positives, so uh, we choose this. We choose this loss. Oh, cool! Thanks. Um, I think that's it. That's all from my side. I saw a question in the chat um, again for the iWildCam team. Uh, specifically, Imeza asked um, to the to the first um, first place team, and I'd, I'd love to hear from Stephen from the third place team as well. Um, did you use the extra data sets, or did you try to use the extra data sets, and um, did they or did they not help? Um, and how, if you did try to use them, how did you try to use them? And just for context, if people didn't um, know the competition, we provided sort of this, it's this extra satellite data as well as this extra iNaturalist data that's sort of a different domain but covering some of the same classes. Uh, from our experience, we tried to use the iNaturalist data set, but uh, my teammate did the test uh, and uh, it's not very helpful to improve the uh, approach. Uh, for example, the efficient net training on image net. So the score didn't boost up. Uh, so we uh, give up because the training time takes so long. And what I have more interest is actually the satellite data because uh, I put a wrong like uh, pre-assumption that this satellite must be very helpful to locate where the camera is, where the animal are, distribute, are distributing across the globe. But actually, uh, it didn't work. So. Uh, um, I think it, is, it will be more interesting if those satellite data can be really helpful to have something to do with the images or camera or whatever. So that will be more, uh, more interesting like competition next year probably. But uh, for this competition, no, it, it, we, we didn't succeed using such kind of data. Yeah, I was sort of like, very hopeful that someone would come up with some really cool way to leverage that, that information because it would be such a valuable thing if you could you know, use satellite data, which is available to try to improve the precision. So I was sad that uh, it didn't seem like any teams were able to get a big boost um, 
but I'm hopeful that it's not, it doesn't mean that it's not useful. It just means that we haven't figured out how to do it yet. And uh, one thing that I do want to do this year, we weren't able to provide actual like GPS locations for those satellite tiles because of some, uh, some of the uh, WCS data providers were worried about maybe the privacy of, of some of the rare animals. Um, but I do think that actually, even if they're pretty obfuscated, some concept of GPS would probably really help disambiguate from the different countries. And, you know, I was hoping that would come implicitly from the satellite, but maybe next year we'll try to actually provide those GPS locations and come up with a way to do it that's safe for the data privacy. Um, Bing Chen, were you able to, did you try and use the data as well? And what were your, um, what was your experience? Um, we tried to use the naturalist data for the computation, but didn't observe any any improvement. And the satellite images, we just have no idea how to use it. And we didn't dig into it, how to use it. So um, we didn't use any extra data set for computation. Yeah, I, so the, the um, and if anyone's interested, they posted um, their solution. Uh, a lot of people posted their solutions in our discussion group, but one team, tried a bunch of really interesting stuff with the satellite data and nothing was like a huge win, but they did see maybe like one, 2% increase in, um, in performance uh, using stuff like looking at like the average greenness of the satellite data, for example, to try and like estimate whether it was a forest or the desert. Um, so, you know, maybe there's something there in the future, but I, I also was a little sad that it, it didn't seem to help as much as I'd hoped. Uh, just, just maybe a uh, a piece of uh, suggestion. So maybe you are right. You think GPS location data is better or very helpful to locate where the camera is or where the uh, the specific species is. But another thing is like if we uh, provide the satellite data in the format of like you know like Google satellite images. So for example, uh, I found uh, some of the uh, animal categories such as birds or eagles. Only quite a few images are provided because probably they are rare to capture. And if the Google satellites, you know, uh, images can provide the aerial view of the eagle captured by the satellite, probably and it requires a military level resolution category, you know, such kind of images. Uh, that will be more helpful. And uh, even if the, uh, the images can clearly show the, maybe the landscape of the areas, so like a bear or like a deer, uh, it's still very helpful to to detect um, or maybe to this uh, to predict which specific animal uh, the image is holding. So yeah, just, so just I think you need really high resolution satellite data to actually capture an animal. But my hope was actually that these um, the satellite images would give us give us some concept of the habitat that an animal might live in. Yeah, that's, that's and so right. maybe if we just had some some sort of higher resolution satellite because. At the resolution we had, it was it was pretty hard to um, to maybe understand like what type of tree you were looking at, for example. Yes, but just the aerial landscape, something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Okay, on to another competition question. Actually, uh, to follow up on that, um, on using additional data, maybe potentially from data sources, I wonder if the folks in the Herbarian Challenge, either Kiat or maybe one of the winners. Um, are you guys aware of any, of any attempt of um, making use of, you know, non-Herbarian sheet images to improve the, the competition, to improve recognition result for Herbarian sheets? So if I'm not wrong, I don't know if Hussam is still here. I think you guys use uh, INET or ImageNet pre-training, right? Yeah, we, we did use uh, iNaturalist as a pre-training and we compared it to, to, you know, to regular ImageNet pre-training and we saw uh, a little improvement, uh, but not something uh, very significant. But, uh, you know, it helps the, you know, making an ensemble and stuff like this. So we did try pre-training of iNaturalist and, and uh, in addition to ImageNet. Uh, hi. Uh, we use the noisy student uh, retraining and it helped a lot. Great. Um, another question that has uh, popped up on chat, and thanks everyone for posting the paper links on chat. Um, another question that has uh, popped up is for uh, the iMaterialist and um, uh, iMed. 
that both of these are um, attribute-based uh, classification questions. Uh, so I think the question was, um, how are we dealing with um, missing attributes in images or missing labels in images? Uh, as I talked about earlier, uh, uh, we used custom rows, which, which don't penalizes false negatives. I mean, uh, we don't want it to penalize this, uh, rather missing. Does it work? Uh, maybe let's, uh, if you can give some uh, pro uh, perspective from maybe either Moling or, or Chen Yang on kind of how the uh, data set construction time, um, what mechanism have you put in place to, you know, uh, in terms of kind of label completeness for, for this multi-class um, classification problems? I guess I can go first. So for iMaterialist fashion, um, we, so during the annotation process for attributes, we have this binary classification scheme where we um, present to annotators uh, one mask at a time and one attributes category at a time, one uh, attributes super category at a time. So instead of choosing from you know, hundreds and of hundreds of attributes, we break it down into smaller groups. So which will make, uh, will make the, the lives of annotators easier and the final results more accurate. But I do have a question for Christine. So when you say missing attributes, what do you mean that? Do you mean the, the annotation is wrong or something? Um, I guess I'm more alluding to, or if I interpret the question right, uh, is um, I'm, I'm more thinking about the IMET case, for example, maybe some artworks don't necessarily have kind of every culture annotated to it. Um, but maybe Chen Yang, you can speak more about how the annotations down for the IMET data set. Yeah, I think for, uh, let's say, for, so we have multiple uh, verticals of attributes. For the free text, uh, each one is audited by human. So that's the only, uh, only quality control we have. But for other uh, text, um, I mean, for like, for example, culture, they are actually audited by professional uh, artwork curators. So that should be more uh, high quality. And uh, I mean, in, in their website, uh, these are also available to public. So I think uh, that's an additional layer of uh, quality. But to be honest, I don't have, I mean, I'm pretty sure that precision of the labeling is pretty high, but I actually am not sure about the recall. Uh, we don't have an audit, a full audit on that. Great, thanks. Um, there's another question popping up in the chat for uh, plan pathology. I guess it's more a comment for the organizer, uh, for Ranjita. Um, so uh, Tao is suggesting to significantly increase in the test set. And I guess as such a popular competition this year, um, a lot of us are curious what uh, you might have in mind for, for next year. Do you want to do a follow-up challenge? What things do you want? Uh, what do you, what things do you want to explore next time? Uh, uh, yeah, for for the next year, we are trying to increase the data set. Definitely more number of images per category, and also we want to increase uh, the disease category because this time we were able to take uh, pictures of only three different disease categories. But definitely, there are many diseases. Uh, uh, diseases that appear in apples. So now this year we are taking a lot more images of different different disease set category. So we are planning to increase both data set as well as disease categories. Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, I guess as we continue to collect more questions for the competition winners um, from kind of each competition's uh, perspective, um, I'm also curious, I think some folks here might have participated in multiple um, competitions this year right, in the FGBC workshop. Um, if anyone uh, who is here who has participated in more than one competitions, um, I'd love to hear your perspectives on um, whether you find there were specific techniques that transfer well from one to another in this fine-grained visual categorization um, 
kind of domain. Well, I, I can try to answer. Well, I, I participate both in planet pathology and herbarium. I finished the seventh place in planet pathology and, and the second place in herbarium. And I can say that uh, both using uh, our dedicated architectural theories that we're trying to, to promote, promote uh, worked, worked uh, uh, quite well for, for both competitions. And also uh, soft drift, drift loss, I used it uh, for both competitions and it, it worked uh, quite well. So both of them I used for the, for the two competitions and I think the, they proved themselves. Great, thank you, Tao. Anyone else here who have participated in more than one competitions? Well, if not, uh, then um, I think another question I have is for um, the both captions, the competition organizers and the competition participant as, um, you know, some of the competition, this is not the first time we run it. Actually, I think only plant pathology and semi-supervisor are the first two first time competitions we run. Um, I'm curious, just from your perspective, as either organizing or as participating in this type of um, challenges, what would you like to see more from kind of the FGVC competitions in the upcoming years? Or kind of what specific questions or problem domains you would like to explore uh, or that you see being explored in FGVC in upcoming years? Well, Shin just brought up sort of maybe like a, a slightly more pointed question in the chat that might be able to kick off the discussion. So um, one of the things that we've worried about, um, and not just with iNaturalist, also with, with my iWildCam competitions, is that we don't want to make the, the competition data sets so large that they're sort of not accessible, that they take too long to train, and, and, and as a result, um, it's just not very easy to actually compete. But also, we don't want them to be so small that the challenge becomes sort of either impossible or um, not interesting. And so how do you feel about like sort of the size of the different competitions? Um, and you know, are you okay with these larger data set competitions or would you really rather we try to come up with creative ways to make competitions that are smaller in size? Um, so just to call on someone to get the discussion started, uh, Stephen, what do you think? Sorry, <laughs> I didn't follow up the question. I was typing an email. <laughs> it's okay, I totally called you up. Um, how did you feel about sort of the sizes of the, the training data sets and testing data sets for the different competitions? Okay. Do you think it was accessible um, or would you rather have it be bigger or smaller? Well, for the competition, the training data set is uh, acceptable. But if the uh, internal, for example, the internal data in the future uh, is still like, is small, relative small, but uh, you know, contains highly, highly helpful information that we uh, imaginary, you know, terrific. But uh, depends, depends on the data source and depends on the format. So, but uh, I'm, I'm very happy with the current data sets. Yeah, this year we really tried to aim for something like not too much bigger than Coco. Like we're, I mean, it was bigger than Coco, but we didn't want it to be an order of magnitude bigger than Coco. Um, yeah, so did anyone else have any feelings about the training? I know that the plant pathology challenge, for example, it was a much smaller data set, and that meant that it was something that people could train up even just entirely on Kaggle. So that might have been um, part of why it was such a popular thing is that it wasn't actually costing people money. To, to so, so maybe one idea I also want to just throw out there just to maybe stimulate discussion is like, would people be interested in like a, like a smaller like kernels only competition, like in that being something more common? Because I, mean, I know that, I, I don't put him on the spot because I, 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 I know, I think he's in the, the room, but I, I don't want to put him on the spot. So I think one of the participants for Herbarium and as well as the other competitions, I think Miroslav, like he, he pretty much does uh, all the training only on kernels. 
Um, and he has like really impressive performance. Like I think this year he got fifth on Herbarium and last year he was third. Uh, and, which, and he was able to beat like uh, people who have these huge clusters. Um, and I, I wonder like, is that something that people will be more interested in seeing? Maybe we can get some perspective from uh, either Chen Yang and Meng Ling as well as organizers for Cornelian competitions. Or actually folks who participate participating in the two Cornelian competitions this year. Um, was your experience significantly different from before or would you recommend this? Uh, I, I would say Cornelian's uh, competition definitely improves the fairness among resource in different groups, but I think that increased the uh, other, I mean, that comes over price that uh, all the infrastructure are dependent on Kaggle. And uh, once you have a technical problem in the infrastructure, you rely on Kaggle's uh, technical support to resolve it. That like basically increased the time, I mean, increase the whole feedback loop. Uh, and also I think uh, in Kaggle community, uh, people are, mo are more uh, familiar with uh, submitting just a spreadsheet. Uh, yeah, I think I, I would I would definitely believe uh, kernelized uh, kernelized uh, competition is a trending thing, uh, but I'm not sure it can fully replace the old version. Uh, especially, I mean, especially for the uh, classification task. I know for other tasks, for example, the uh, reinforcement learning uh, agent, uh, environment is a totally different story. Uh, we, re we really rely on having infrastructure to run simulation and whatnot. So one thing I was, one of the reasons I'd really thought heavily about trying to make this year's competition a kernel competition for iWildCam, but since iWildCam is like sort of slightly outside the domain of a lot of normal like um, computer vision style stuff and that like the test data is significantly different and we're providing some of these other types of data that people can or can't use based on their own like interest. Um, it feels like potentially it could be quite restrictive um, because some people are doing things like running one model, using the outputs of that model, trying them, running them and training through another model and then like, you know, all of this sort of modular stuff um, can be a lot harder to set up in kind of like an end to end um, kernel way, and especially something that would actually be able to train within the, sort of the constraints of a kernel competition. Um, so I don't know if either, like, if kernel competitions can get more flexible, or um, or if it's still worth just sort of having them be having some of the competitions be offline to allow more flexibility. Yeah, I think um, actually this is relevant to the conversation that's happening on chat right now where um, folks are suggesting having a track or kind of um, a, a separate thing for a single model only. Um, and there's a discussion on how can we tell apart a single model from ensemble models. Um, but I'd like, actually like to hear folks' thoughts. Um, you know, instead of us kind of limiting either the model architecture, instead of limiting single versus ensemble, I mean, I see, I see the benefits of ensembling. Um, perhaps a, um, a different ways we can limit the number of parameters in a model or we can limit the size of the model. Um, this may not be applicable to all competitions, but uh, uh, for example, for the wildlife, um, for the wild, um, wildlife camera trap uh, data sets, potentially one of the goal in the future is to deploy these models on this um, uh, remote sensing uh, stations, right? And then there's a lot of constraints on how big the model is, where it can run, and potentially we can explore ways where you know, model size itself is limited. Um, yeah, absolutely. And it's something we've thought about um, and discussed. There's a couple different um, sort of companies that are developing uh, smart camera traps. And so one of the things we've thought about is, you know, maybe next year's or a few years from now, um, we might actually like partner with one of those companies and specifically focus on trying to build the best possible edge model for, for camera trap data. Yeah. Yeah, this is definitely something we as organizers will take back and discuss as we start to prepare for next year's FGVC proposal, potentially we can uh, shortlist a couple of competitions where we do, as uh, people suggested, either have a maximum number of parameters or having even latency requirements on um, how fast models should run as a way to say that, you know, like you cannot just throw billions of parameters into this problem and, and uh, yeah, um, and try to um, just train from that, so.
Great. Um, any audience who want to ask live questions to folks here or any um, remaining questions from the competition, uh, from the competitions? Well, if not, uh, I think uh, we can thank the competition organizers and the winners for joining us. A lot of them are in very challenging time zones. So thank you so much for staying up uh, to join us and congratulations on the competition winners again. And with that, uh, we'll, um, we'll still keep the Zoom room here. So if you wanna stick around and chat with others on the chat um, panel and then we're still gonna be around. And uh, also just a reminder, our next live session for FGDC7 starts in uh, exactly one hour.